Okay, welcome everyone. This is Power to the Native Pollinators. Um, it's a program in our Granby Grows virtual series. Welcome everyone, we're glad you're here. Um, we're gonna meet our native pollinators tonight with Emma Hoyt. Emma has a degree, um, it's called a degree in E3B, that's Ecology, Evolution and Environmental Biology. And she is a farmer with Holcomb Farm in West Granby, Connecticut. Um, she's going to introduce not only the bees and the butterflies, but a whole swarm of pollinating insects that are vital to a healthy and diverse food production system. We're going to learn about the multiple threats facing our pollinators and the ways we can protect and restore their health and habitat. That sounds great. So um, a little bit more about Emma. She's been farming vegetables and fruit without pesticides for 15 years in the tri-state area. I mentioned she has a degree in uh, E3B, which is the Ecology, Evolution, and Environmental Biology. And she, as a result, she's always been closely observing the relationship between farming and the natural world and striving to find ways to farm in harmony with its inhabitants rather than battling with them. She works at Holcomb Farm in Granby alongside her partner, Joe, and she is teaching her children to appreciate insects and weeds. And I think that's a marvelous thing for anybody to learn about. And so um, having said all of that, I want to warmly welcome Emma to our program tonight. Thank you for being here and I'll let you take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Holly. Um, so hi everyone. Like uh, Holly said, my name is Emma Hoyt. Um, she pretty much did my, um, present my my introduction so I guess I will skip that part and we can go straight to the pollinators um, I'm going to share my slideshow with you all right so there it is um, so we'll go to whoop, let's see Let's see, is not, sorry guys, let me just figure this out. Um, we did have your screen and it did look good to start. So you were filling the screen with your PowerPoint slide. I, I just, it wasn't moving. So yeah. let's see if I can, let's see, there we go. All right. So first of all, what is pollination? Um, you might remember this from biology in high school or college, but um, pollination is the process by which um, flowers uh, are fertilized. Um, most plants in, in the world need uh, to be pollinated to set fruit and seed. And the pollen is the male part, it's the sperm of the flower, um, because flowers have male and female parts, and the, the process of pollinate, pollinization is bringing pollen to the female part of the flower, and that's how it sets seed and fruit. So um, most plants in the world need to be pollinated, and that includes a, um, a third of our food supply, as you can see. Um, pretty much all fruit. And a lot of vegetables are technically fruit um, and nuts as well, because they uh, come from fruit, many of them. Um, who are our pollinators? Uh, most of them are insects. Uh, let's see, where's my list? Um, bees, butterflies, some beetles, some moths, some wasps, some flies, some bats and hummingbirds. Um, I'm going to focus on insects tonight. I'm not going to focus on bats or hummingbirds. Um, but anything, anything I talk about that's going to benefit pollinators uh, will also benefit them. Because we're, we're going to be talking about building up our ecosystem, benefiting our local ecosystem, and they are part of it, so they will benefit. Um, let's see. So, like I said. A third of our food supply is supplied by uh, pollinators, um, and 75% of the flowering plants on Earth rely on pollinators to some degree. And 
this time in our world, our population is booming and we are wondering how we're gonna feed everybody, we need to pay attention to the health of our pollinating insects. I'll read a quote from an article um, from the Food and Environment Reporting Network. As we enter an era of dire food insecurity, one of the easiest things we can do to ensure the global food supply is to enhance populations of wild pollinators. Unfortunately, we seem to be doing just the opposite. Um, there's been studies that say that farms in Africa, Asia, and Latin America could amp up their production just by enhancing pollinator habitat. They can fill, fill the yield gap. Um, we don't need pesticides, we don't need GMOs, we don't need industrial agriculture, we just need more pollinators. Um, insects in general are a major foundation of our ecosystems. They feed all kinds of larger animals um, and they are all, almost all of them are declining and that includes pollinators. Um, There's a, there's a study, wild bees have declined 23% in the last five years in, in this country. Insects in general, in some places in the world have declined by 76%. Um, there's a few that are increasing, but most are decreasing, most species. And this is due to habitat loss, pesticides, climate change, um, introduced pathogens and invasive species. I'm sure everybody knows the monarch butterfly. Um, they've declined a lot. Probably people remember seeing a lot more of them in the past. Um, I, this past summer, I didn't see many at all. Usually we have a lot in our yard. I think I saw five. Um, so if, if we lose pollinators, we're gonna have a lot of trouble feeding ourselves and um, there may be other impacts as well because they are integral to our ecosystem. Um, all right, so let's see. Yeah, here's, a, here's the cover of the, what is it? The May, May 2020 issue of the National Geographic magazine. The insects are disappearing. All right, so who are our native pollinators? According to uh, Connecticut Deep, the Department of Energy and Environmental Protection, there are over 300 species of bees in Connecticut. And they are the best pollinators of the insect world because they're hairy, they collect pollen and use it for food. So they're really designed to get pollen all over their bodies. Um, they have long mouth parts for getting nectar, and they uh, display an important behavior called flower constancy, where they repeatedly visit one particular species of plant on any given forage trip. Bumblebees um, and other bees use buzz pollination, which na many Native American plants require for proper pollination. That's something that honeybees do not do. Um, so some of our, our bees are bumblebees, longhorned bees, which are the ones in the middle on that sunflower. They really like sunflowers. Squash bees, which as you can see, pollinate squash. Um, we have carpenter bees, sweat bees, mining bees, digger bees, many different kinds of bees mason bees, orchard mason bees. Um, a little note about honeybees. I'm sure you're all saying, what about the honeybees? Um, honeybees are not native. They originally come from Africa. They don't use buzz pollination. They usually visit a single plant before going back to their hive. So they're not that good at pollinating. Um, we use them for pollinating. Giant beekeepers transport them all over the country to pollinate big orchards and farms, but they're actually not that efficient at it. Um, they also spread disease because they're not really taken well care of 
um, when they're in these mass apiaries. And so they spread disease to native bees and um, the native bees, several studies have shown they do a much better job. Um, there was a study done in Vermont that noted the yield and size of blueberries were much better uh, depending on how many wild bee visits they had. Um, and so the more, the more wild bees visited those blueberry plants, the bigger and better the blueberries were. And um, the, more, the more natural habitat around those farms, the more visits they had from these wild bees. And the, the farm that got the most visits by far was the messiest. And I will explain what I mean by messy um, in a little bit. So after bees, we have butterflies. Oh, here's a, um, this is just illustrates a, a little study that um, somebody did with blue orchard bees um, pollinating cherry orchards. They did much better than honeybees is basically what it's saying. So here are butterflies, um, much better known than bees, but actually not as efficient at pollinating. Um, they don't provide the same amount of pollination services because they are not hairy. They don't consume pollen. They drink nectar using uh, a long tubular mouth part called the proboscis. So sometimes they can kind of bypass the, uh, the pollen in the flower. Um, although some plants are specialized to attract butterflies and they need the butterfly to, um, to get that nectar and they're, therefore get the pollen. Um, they get it on their feet sometimes too. So uh, some of our, our native butterflies are swallowtails, monarchs, fritillaries, cabbage whites, sulfurs, painted ladies. Uh, the one on the left is a swallowtail, the one in the middle is a monarch. I'm not sure what that one on the right is. I can't remember. Um, it, but here's some caterpillars. Mo uh, butterflies are very important to the ecosystem, mostly in the form of caterpillars because they're a major food source um, for birds and other creatures. So they're majorly important to um, the ecosystem and they pollinate. So we have some other less, less known pollinators here. We have moths. Um, many moths don't feed as adults, but there are a few species that are important pollinators. Up in the left corner, we have the sphinx or hawk moths. And those are actually, if you've ever grown tomatoes and you've seen a tomato or a tobacco hornworm, that turns into this guy on the top left. Um, so you should appreciate your hornworms. Um, the other moths that pollinate, tiger moths, owlet moths, geometer moths. Um, there are some very specialized moths that only pollinate one plant, such as the evening primrose moth. That's on the bottom left here, that pink one. Um, evening primrose grows around here. It's a weed. Here's also um, wasps. The top one is a golden digger wasp. It's big, but it's actually not that aggressive. It looks scary, but um, they visit flowers for nectar, but they are not great pollinators because they're not hairy. They have short mouth parts, um, but they do some incidental pollination like butterflies and moths. And they also will eat pests in your garden. They look for caterpillars and grasshoppers to feed their young. So they provide a service. Um, flies, on the right top and bottom, we have some flies. Uh, the ones that visit flowers are mostly um, the, in the family Surfidae. Those are the hover or the flower flies. You see them kind of hovering around your flowers. Um, 
they look like little helicopters sometimes and they they look like bees actually they have those yellow and black stripes um, there's another family that looks similar called bee mimics because they mimic bees um, house flies will visit flowers and another group called tachinid flies that's the top right one they are hairy and they drink nectar so they do provide some pollination um, we also have beetles soldier beetles that's the one on the bottom middle they visit flowers for food um, and beetles in general are also good at moving seeds around that's not pollination but that's good for plants um, so that is our those are who we are pollinating that's who's pollinating our plants whoops sorry all right, so what can we do for pollinators? How can we help them? Uh, we need to create more habitat, firstly. Um, here's a yard. A yard is a monoculture. It's short grass and it's nothing else. And that's not going to feed a pollinator. So I would say, firstly, we need to dedicate part of our yard or all of it, if you're feeling generous to the pollinators, we need to get a little messier. Um, I was talking about that messy farm in Vermont. Um, so what I mean by messy is we need to get more like nature. Nature is not neat. Um, you can create a section of your yard that becomes um, like a prairie or a wild spot. You can let weeds and grass grow longer because a lot of our, our weeds are native plants that host caterpillars or have flowers that feed our pollinators. Um, long grass makes cover for rodents. And after the rodents have made a nest and left, the bumblebees will use those old nest sites for their nests. You need to leave some bare patches of ground for ground nesting bees. A lot of bees, um, Unlike honeybees, they are solitary and they live uh, in the ground by themselves. You need to leave your stems, your sticks, your logs, and your dead standing trees as homes for bees that live in wood or in hollow stems. Don't cut your dead stems at the end of the season when you're trying to neaten up your garden and clean it up for the winter. Leave all your dead stems in place because these will be homes for overwintering bees and other creatures or their eggs. Some caterpillars overwinter and they, they'll live in those places. Um, leave your leaves. If you can leave some of your leaves on your lawn or in certain spots, those are also homes that pollinators can use. Um, you can install an eco lawn if you're feeling really ambitious. Um, meaning there are certain grasses that will not grow very tall, so you never have to mow them. You can put some dandelions, and short clovers, white clovers in there, violets, and your lawn can be a mix of pollinator friendly plants. And you won't have to mow. Dedicating some of your lawn to pollinators saves you time and money and gas. It's better for the environment because then you don't have to spend all your time mowing it and fertilizing it. Um, and these things will also bring other wildlife to your yard. If you like birds, letting your weeds grow and letting them go to seed will bring you tons of birds to your lawn. Um, we do that in my yard and we always have good winter birds. Looking out the window, we see lots of um, bluebirds and goldfinches and juncos because they're eating all the seeds on our, our weeds that we let just grow. Um, okay, so another thing, well, let me just explain my slides here. Um, this, is, this is a vacant lot. It's full of, it's messy, it's full of weeds, but I had to take a picture in the winter because it was winter. But if it was summer, it would be full of um, milkweed and goldenrod, and that would be a, a big habitat for pollinators. I know a lot of 
people probably look at it and say it's empty space. It needs to be filled. It needs to be developed, but it's already full. It's a home for a lot of creatures. Um, so we need to kind of reconfigure how we, how we see our properties and how we see the land because that's somebody's home. And this, this is, this is not, <laughs> this is empty <laughs> to me. So, um, the, the picture on the left is my house and my yard, and it's, uh, it's full of some pollinator friendly plants. It's got butterfly weed in there and Queen Anne's lace. And in the back is some, uh, evening primrose and there's some mint in there as well. And it's just, just goes crazy with bees and wasps and butterflies. Um, and on the right is another picture with a little more, a little prettier with, um, but still kind of natural with lots of pollinator friendly flowers in there. Um, all right, so another major step you can take to encourage pollinators in your yard is if you use chemicals like synthetic fertilizers or pesticides, you should stop using those. Um, pesticides especially can indiscriminately kill or harm insects and the plants they depend on, as well as other wildlife. And they also are not good for you. They can hurt you, they can make you sick. Um, they don't always solve the problem either. Um, there's lots of alternatives to using chemicals in your yard. You can, you can mulch with cardboard or newspaper and chips or leaves or straw. You can mow something that, you know, is, is growing and you don't want it there. Um, repeated mowing will kill invasive species. Um, you can give plants a more natural organic fertilizer. Um, I, I'm well versed in these. So if anybody has questions about solutions for avoiding chemicals in your yard, I'm happy to take questions at the end about that. Um, I think you'll find if you, if you go organic in your yard and you grow things that encourage the local uh, pollinator population, you'll find that um, pest situations will balance themselves out because uh, a lot of pollinators also take care of pests, especially wasps. Um, so don't knock down the wasp nests on top of your garage either, because they do play a part. As I tell my daughter, they all play a part. Um, thirdly, you can plant more stuff. You can, you can encourage what's, uh, what's already there, the weeds, and you can also buy in plants if you want to buy, um, special plants for pollinators. Basically, you want anything native. I'll give you a, a short list. You can find lots of lists um, online and I'll have resources at the end or you can find books. But um, let's see. Oh, I'm behind in my slides. This is a picture of, um, these are pictures of two uh, praying mantis egg cases. They're not pollinators, but I'm just showing you this because um, they're hidden. You, it's hard to find them, but, but they're hidden. They're there in my garden. And if I cut down all my stems and threw them away, I would be throwing away my praying mantises for next year. And there's definitely others hiding in there. Um, so leave your stems and your leaves. All right, so let's get to what we can plant. Um, we have here, we've got on the left, asters, goldenrods, dandelions, basically any of the native weeds are, are going to host somebody. Um, dock, evening primrose, joe pie weed, coneflowers, hyssops, culver's root, blazing star, blanket flower. Um, I got more pictures here. Milkweeds, everybody knows milkweeds feed um, monarchs. Um, Joe pie weed is on the bottom right hand side and on the top on the left here is um, Jerusalem artichokes, which are a native sunflower. So native sunflowers. Um, 
blueberries. Blueberries bring a lot of pollinators. Service berries, also known as June berries. Um, willows, not weeping willows. Those don't feed anybody. But um, things like pussy willows have are really good for early feeding. Um, they're one of the first to bloom. Linden trees, American linden, also known as basswood. Choke berries or aronia berries. Um, wild geranium little blue stem grass, some grasses you'll think, oh, why, you know, why would I plant those? They're not going to feed anybody, but they are actually host plants to um, certain caterpillars. Another one is northern switchgrass, and then um, any of our native trees, oaks, wild cherries, locusts. Um, basically, if it's native, it's going to feed somebody. Um, here's some more lupins, lobelia, mountain mint. Um, if you want to plant uh, a garden, if you have a garden in your yard, a vegetable or an herb garden or a flower garden, that will definitely feed some pollinators. They like lots of, um, lots of the annual flowers and the vegetables and the um, herbs that we grow. Um, uh, if you're going to choose annual flowers, you should choose ones that um, are like single petaled um, and have pollen. If you get something that's double petaled or um, is pollenless, that's not going to feed the, the pollinators. Um, and also if you're choosing plants to put in your yard that are native, you wanna try and avoid, um, avoid cultivars, which are named and bred varieties. Even if they're native, if, they're, if they've been bred for certain attributes like the color of their leaf or something it, they're they've been shown not to be as popular with pollinators um, they'll still visit them but you'll have they'll get a lot more visits if it's like the original version um lastly let's see i have more pictures pussy willow red bud american linden lastly um if you want to go one step further, you can install some housing for the bees. Um, I have a little wooden bee house. It's basically a block of wood with different size holes drilled into it. And every year, certain bees come in. I don't even know who's in there. It's all different kinds. Um, I think there's some carpenter bees in there, but there's also other kinds because the holes are different sizes and they they prefer different sizes, different species prefer different sizes of holes. Um, they make nests, they lay eggs, um, and then they new bees emerge. You can put some of those around. You can put um, a hay or a straw bale in your yard in the corner, and um, some rodents will make nests in there. And after they leave, bumblebees will come in and make homes in there. Just make sure you get um, bales without chemicals because certain um, straw often has a lot of pesticides in them. Um, you can, if you have old stumps or logs in your yard, you can drill holes directly in there, different sizes to encourage bees to make homes in there. Um, and if you're planting a garden with herbs, um, there's lots of good herbs that bees like. We've got basil, sage, mint, oregano, parsley, um, the top one, dill. The, um, they really like the flowers on the basil, sage, mint, thyme family. And then uh, black swallowtails, the things in the umble family, dill, parsley, carrot, Queen Anne's lace, um, parsnip. Those are host plants to the black swallowtail and also pollinators like the flowers as well. Um, and if you have other vegetables growing, tomatoes, squash, um, you can let your broccoli and kale go to seed and flower. That's the last photo on the right there is um, uh, broccoli flowers that have gotten tall and become flowers. They really like those as well. And here are some annual flowers that pollinators like. 
Um, the top left one is Tithonia, Mexican sunflower. That's a really a popular one with the pollinators. The bottom left is bachelor button. The one in the middle is a dahlia, but as you can see, it's got a nice open middle so that that bee can get the pollen. There's a lot of dahlias that don't do that. Um, top right is a sunflower and the bottom right is cosmos. And those are all popular flowers with bees and butterflies and other pollinators. Um, here's a picture of the herb garden. Oops. Here's a picture of the herb garden at Holcomb Farm. Um, it's quite messy, but I think it looks beautiful. And in the front is some bronze fennel. And in the back, the most of the background is borage, which is another um, herb that bumblebees really love. And uh, I think the rest is weeds and that's okay because it's fine. It's, it's what nature does. And you can always mulch them at some point. Um, so I have some lists of resources. If you're looking for seeds or plants, um, Fedco seeds or organic grower supplies, they have, um, in addition to seeds and plants, they also sell fruit trees and native trees. Um, and they do have bee houses. That's where I got my bee house from. Um, the second list is, those are all fruit and vegetable seed companies in the Northeast. And they, so they will have um, annual flowers and herbs um, that you can buy to plant. And they also, um, almost all of these places have like a mix, like a pollinator mix or a native seed mix that you can get and just throw around your garden if you just wanna do it in one go. Um, Prairie Moon Nursery is a nursery that um, specifically deals in native seeds and plants. And they actually, um, you can look up like uh, host plants for specific butterflies. If you really like certain butterflies, you can buy the host plants for them. Um, there are a couple of nurseries that um, specialize in native plants. Earth Tones in Woodbury, Native Plant Nursery in Fairfield, Nasami Farm in Watley. Um, and if you want, um, if you want to find lists, better lists, um, or more information about pollinators, these are some places that you can find. Circe Society, that second one is great. They are they're a nonprofit dedicated to pollinators, to saving pollinators, and I use them for most of my information tonight. They have a couple of books um, that are really, really helpful. I have, I have one, it's called Attracting Native Pollinators, and they also have one um, called The 100 Plants to Feed the Bees, which is just a list of plants. Um, Two, two organizations um, that kind of are doing the same thing, Pollinator Pathway and Homegrown National Park. Those are two nonprofits that are trying to encourage people to plant habitat in their yards, um, which is what I'm trying to encourage you to do. And if you want another presentation on pollinators and what you can plant, um, there is one called Improving Pollinator Habitat. There's two parts to it, it's long. I know for math, um, this guy really goes into the pros and cons of each plant. So if you want more details on what to plant and the pros and cons of each one, that's a good one to listen to. Um, so, and lastly, another thing you can do is encourage your children and your grandchildren to love pollinators and nature and um, because that is very important. That will help us spread the word. My girls are mostly on board. <laughs> They're not sure about the wasps. So that is my presentation. I am happy to take 
um, some questions. So Emma, thank you very much. I did learn a few things along the way there. I appreciate um, all the effort that you went into identifying the plants and the uh, the insects. That was really cool. Um, I did have one question come in earlier while you were speaking, and um, that was if you have any of those lists available mm -hmm. um, so that I can send them to the program attendees afterward. Um, so if if um, there's lists available, um, I'll um, definitely forward the information out to the folks um, with some of the. Yeah, I, I don't have like a typed up list. Um, I definitely would recommend like this book is just it's basically a list. Um, there go. 100 plants to feed the bees and the, the other Xerxes book also has um the back of it has a lot of plants you can also go online on their website they have lists um the connecticut botanical society has lists um yeah and i i recommend that presentation that i mentioned because he really goes into detail okay that sounds good um and uh, just so that everybody knows, some of those um, books that Emma just shared with you are, are available at the library. We, whoop, here we go. Let me do that. Oh, yeah. This, um, I got this is from the library. Yeah, that's a good <laughs> library book. And I think we have a couple of copies of Attracting Native Pollinators. We just got a brand new one, um, The uh, Nature and Necessity of Bees by Thor Hansen. So this one just came in brand new. I don't even think it's been checked out yet. Um, so there's another one. And then Our Native Bees, we've had um, Paige Embry. Um, this is fairly new. We just we had this one just a few months. Sorry for the glare. Uh, but yeah, the library actually has a pretty good selection on pollination. And the um, uh link that emma mentioned i think is another good spot to go to so we've also got some questions here um well, we've got a lot of questions actually coming in all yeah. right wait a minute this is getting exciting i gotta put my glasses on all right um so someone would like to know if you could explain is buzz pollination buzz pollination mm -hmm. yeah um basically it's um I know bumblebees do it. I, I think other bees do it as well. They'll go and they'll grab onto a flower and they'll buzz their wings and make the whole flower vibrate at like a certain frequency. These, these flowers need to be vibrated at this certain frequency to release a lot of pollen. So they'll grab onto the flower and they'll buzz and then it'll release a bunch of pollen which will coat the bee and the bee will be covered in pollen and then it will go to another flower and it will do the same thing and it will smear all the pollen on its body all over the flower. Um, therefore, you know, putting the pollen on the next flower and putting it on the female parts. And so each time it goes onto a flower, it buzzes. Like if you've watched a bumblebee, which I, I do a lot at the farm, you'll you'll see it hit the flower and it'll go and it's it's buzzing. It's hitting a certain frequency to make it release that um, pollen. Okay. So that Thank is you. buzz pollination. That's exciting. <laughs> I didn't really know they were doing that. That's pretty exciting. Mm -hmm. um, so we did have. Um, I just wanted to answer another question. Um, someone was asking about the uh, seed sites and nurseries. I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll go back to the recording and I'll make a list and then I can send that to. Sure, I can, um, I can easily can, put it back up if you want. Or we can put the slide back up too. And if people have pen and pencil, they can take a copy or I can um, email that off to folks too. And um, while we were doing that, um, there was another question that came in regarding um, the, uh, how far from the vegetable garden do we need to have the pollinators? Do the pollinators need to be right in your vegetable garden or how, how far away are they and how effective are they um, when they're supposed to be doing their thing? I guess, do they travel miles and miles to go do their pollination? Yeah, bees can travel pretty far. Um, if you're, 
I mean, you can have it mixed together if, if I mean, people's yards aren't that big. If you have your pollinator garden on one side and your vegetable garden on the other side, that's fine. They'll find each other. Um, you can plant it all together if it's easier. Um, I, I don't know how far different bees travel. I know honeybees can travel up to five miles um, from their hive. So I, I, I don't know. I mean, there's so many different species of bees. I'm sure the smaller bees travel less distance, but I think a matter of, you know, a hundred feet is not gonna be a big deal for a bee. Okay, thank you. Um, let's see here. Do you have any recommendation of native plants that are easy to start from seed? Um, well, it, it would be easy to go, um, let's see. I know milkweed is pretty easy. If you can find, you can find some milkweed that's, um, you know, growing wild and the pods are opening, you can just grab a bunch of seed and throw it around your yard wherever you want it to grow. Um, I've been doing that with my butterfly weed. It, it just self seeds basically. Um, it comes up all over my garden. Um, I mean, uh, weeds are tenacious. So if you wanna grow some weeds, you know, you can grab seed from weeds that you find around and you can throw them wherever you want. Um, I, I'm trying to think of, I mean, a lot of, um, a lot of the annual flowers are pretty easy. Cosmos is easy. Tithonia is pretty easy. Sunflowers are very easy. Um, you know, and if, if seed is daunting, if starting from seed is daunting, you can get plants from these nurseries. Um, sometimes that's easier for people if they don't have places to start seed. Okay. That sounds, that's helpful. Thank you. Um, another question we have is the best way to turn your lawn into a pollinator friendly area without actually rototilling up your lawn. Is there a way to take all that wonderful turf that you've been cultivating all those years? And sure. Yeah. Um, yeah, it, you can, um, you can do some cardboard mulching. It's also called lasagna mulching. Um, you know, it, it's, it's not gonna be the quickest way to do it, but if you sort of plan ahead, it's the gentlest way to do it. Um, you collect a bunch of cardboard or newspaper if you want, and you can, in the fall, you can lay it over your spot that you're gonna use. You can also use black plastic if you have that. Um, use some rocks to hold it down in the space that you want to um, kill the grass. You could use clear plastic too in the summer. Um, that would solarize the grass. It would kill it because um, it would overheat. Um, but I guess I feel like the easiest method is cover it in the fall and you can cover it. If you're using cardboard or newspaper, you won't have to remove that stuff. Um, if you're using plastic, you'll have to remove the plastic at some point, but cover it up with um, wood chips or leaves or straw or hay. Um, and in the spring, when you're ready to plant, you can just punch holes right through because the cardboard or newspaper will have softened up or even rotted away. And you can plant your plants or your seeds right into there and um, the mulch will suppress the weeds or the grass that wants to come back and it will eventually break down and feed your soil and you can add new mulch as needed. I think that's the easiest way. Sounds good and um, one of our uh, staff who's also here um, at the program just pointed out that there is a book on lasagna gardening. There you go right here at the library another one we've got some really good new books um for folks and just while we're talking about that um so the library is open for browsing appointments and we're still doing curbside appointments so if you're not sure um 
whether you can get in and you still want to pick things up um, from a distance at the curbside pickup, we can do that for you too. Just give us a call, 860-844-5275. And um, you'll be, um, our staff are happy to talk to you. You can also email us, but if you want to talk to a live person, we're, we're here, we are here. Um, and I also wanted to mention that if you're interested in um, additional programming about native plants and, and how to have those um, improve the environment, we will be hosting another speaker next Monday. Um, that'll be Douglas Tallamy from the University of Delaware. And um, he'll be talking about that too. We seem to be on a roll lately. We're doing a lot for our local habitat and our native environment. So um, definitely take a look at the uh, program calendar and register for what appeals to you. Um, so I didn't mean to get off tangent there or off topic too far, but does anybody have any other questions? Did we have anything else? Um, oh, here we go. Um, are there any plants that naturally speed up the decay of wood chips? Um, not to my knowledge. I don't know of any plants that will that will help wood chips decay. Um, mushrooms, fungi will will digest wood chips. Um, you could try you could try getting some. Um, I don't know if you go into the woods and you find some. Sometimes if you dig under the leaves, you can find mycelium, which is the white roots of fungi. You can dig those up and bury them in your wood chips and they might spread and digest. Um, yeah, I don't think there's any plants that will eat the wood chips, but as they decay, they, they do um, enhance the soil and, and um, plants really like that in general. They really like decayed wood chips, um, but I don't think they actually contribute to digesting them. It's other things do that. Yeah. Yeah, if you, you can compost them and they'll make really nice compost as somebody is chatting about. And um, suggestions for native say. ground covers that don't spread aggressively. Um, clover. White clover is the shortest one. So if you don't want to mow it, that's probably the best. Red clover gets taller. Um, native ground. I mean, you can, you can plant grasses. There are important grasses for pollinators. Um, there are certain sedges and like I mentioned, little blue stem. Um, thyme. Thyme can be a good ground cover. Um, th that's not aggressive. Um, that's all I can think of off the top of my head. Um, mint is aggressive, but if you mow it, if you mow the edges, it won't spread out of, you know, out of, you can keep it contained, um, as I've found out. <laughs> I don't know. That's I, I had a moment with mint several years ago, mint and oregano, and I swore I'd never go back. <laughs> so, it was quite the quite the gardening experience. Um, but my there's partner, no I was gonna say my partner Joe, he likes to throw things wherever he can. So he put mint around our house and I was mad at him because I knew it was gonna spread everywhere, but and it did. But I, I have to say I'm happy about it now because we get so many pollinators on it when it flowers and we can, you know, we do mow where we don't want it and it's fine. It, it worked out fine. Um, but that is an aggressive one. And it looks like we had that other question about the worms. What kind of an undesirable, what undesirable yeah, worms? What worms they are. Yeah. Which worms eat up the milkweed each year? They are these black and red fuzzy little things that come onto the milkweed after the milkweed is blown. And they will like lay about 200 little eggs and then they turn into worms and they devour like half the plant before I see them and then try to figure out how to get rid of them without spraying poisons. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you know anything about that. 
Well, if if they're worms, I, I don't they're know. They're caterpillars. They're caterpillars. The caterpillars? Yes. Hmm. I, I don't know. I haven't seen this before. Um, they're probably monarch caterpillars. Well, they wouldn't be black and red. Uh, and a monarch or not, they're red and yellow. Or no, green and yellow. Oh, they're not monarchs. They're not monarchs? No, they're definitely not monarchs. They just devour the, the entire plant. And they, I've been having a problem with them now for about the last three or four years. Well, I just did a quick check here at, at your local library. I just did a quick check. And it says that the red and black bugs that are on the milkweed um, are called small milkweed bug or Legagus calmi. And the bugs have very few predators. They feed on toxic milkweed, which makes them very distasteful to predators. And so the prey tend to avoid them. Um, their warning colors are red and black. And that um, strikes home, I guess, the fact that um, they're toxic. Um, and I guess you've, though, they're, I guess they're called milk, in a nutshell, I guess they're called milkweed bugs. Um, and they're primarily seed eaters. But anyhow, there is information out there um, on the net. So um, I don't know if that helps a little bit, but they, um, what else can I read about this? Um, I guess I would just say um, you could try removing the plants with the, bugs on them you could remove the whole plant you know cut it and take it somewhere else or compost it to get rid of them um i don't i don't know what they are that doesn't sound familiar um but you know if, if i would just try to remove them maybe yeah i usually go out every morning come about maybe late july and i've sprayed um salt water solution on them i have sprayed vinegar solution on them and it just like you said i literally have to cut the whole leaf off and continue to do that and literally keep up with it if not it, it just devours the entire milkweed <laughs> the point where the milkweed dies out it doesn't tend to come back the next year mm -hmm. well yeah i guess i would just try manual removal um, to see if you can stop that population. I'm going to look it up. I want to know what this creature is. Yeah, they're, they're pretty, they're kind of pretty. They really are a very intense red and black with their markings. Um, but yeah, they're a problem. Um, oh, we have more questions coming in. What else? Um, let's see here. A natural solution to that, milkweed, tussock caterpillars, they're hairy. No, we didn't have those. These are definitely these um, red and black milkweed bugs is what they call them. Um, and you do have some, uh, Here's some folk. there we go, thank you. I can show the other one in a minute too, if needed. All right, so seed and plant resources, that's excellent. Is that the one they wanted or did they want the other one? No, that was, this is the first, this is the one that was in the question in chat, okay. so. Okay. Yes. Oh, I know what I was, I had a question for you um, while we're looking at this slide. Um, when you mentioned not cutting down your, your dead stalks and stems in the fall, which I've been pretty good about leaving them but I always get to the spring and I want to start cleaning up at some point when the you know when the new growth starts coming up um, do you have any recommended is there a recommended time frame I mean sometimes there's rules of thumb out there like do this when the forsythia bloom or do that when the I don't know when the first bluebird comes by I don't know <laughs> do, do yeah. you have any um thoughts yeah, well, I, I, it depends a little bit on the species, but I guess most bees are out and about by May. Um, so you could probably clean up, you know, by Mother's Day, probably, depending on, give or take, depending on what the weather's been like. Um, and I guess, you know, if you, if you really needed to clean them up, you could, you could, you know, very gently collect them and place them somewhere so that they're not trampled or crushed or anything, just in case somebody's in there. Um, always better to leave them in place. But yeah, I think, you know, you could probably safely clean stuff up 
by um, mid-May, late May. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, well, do we have any other questions from our audience before, before we finish? Looks like looks like it's quiet out there i want to put in one more plug i know we did have a question about the wood chips um we are hosting um a backyard mushroom growing program uh, at the end of april so um if you're looking to do a little mushroom growing i know emma you mentioned putting some of that um what is it some fungus on there maybe that would help things move along <laughs> um but anyhow, we've got a lot going on. Um, thank you so much, Emma, for all your beautiful photos and uh, all the, I, I, I love it when I can get a handful of takeaways from a program and you really did provide those tonight. So I thank you for that. That was excellent. Oh, it was my pleasure. And we'll, um, I'll try to get this um, converted and loaded to our library YouTube channel so that if anybody wants to go back and reference something, they'll be able to look that up on the, uh, YouTube channel for Granby Public Library. And so um, thank you all for coming. I'm glad you were able to find the time in here. Emma, you're getting all kinds of thank yous. Yes. The chat's just exploding with all the good, good wishes. So again, I thank you all for coming tonight and um, we'll look forward to seeing you at another library program. <laughs>